Good morning and welcome. Uh, I'm Andre and I'll be the host here for this workshop in which we will discuss how we can find vulnerabilities with open source tooling. Um, some words about me. Uh, as I previously mentioned, I'm Andre. Uh, I was in the Romanian army for one year and a half. And after that, and after having a cybersecurity startup, I decided to move forward and to enter Canonical in the Ubuntu security team as a software security engineer. Um, I'm from Romania, from Bucharest more exactly. Uh, I'm powered by Americanos. I love coffee and uh, yeah, I love, I have long distance running, running as a hobby. So if you want to have a long run after this workshop and this conference, let me know. Yeah. Um, we have here to, let's start with a metaphor, namely the open book. And we can think about open source software in general as, a, as an open book, because any attacker can see the code, can review the code and can find vulnerabilities in that code. And for us as maintainer, this is of interest. We need to find vulnerabilities in our code basis before an attacker does and before they start attacking our our users that have our software in production environments. Um, let's look an, at an example from the open source space, namely Browncube Webmail. Uh, it's an open source browser-based IMAP client. So if you have an email server, hosted, maybe this is the client that you prefer. Uh, it's hosted at the moment on GitHub. It's open source, as I mentioned before. Uh, it has 5.2K stars uh, at the end of the previous month. And it's written it in XHTML, CSS, JavaScript with jQuery and um, PHP. Let's look at this code path, namely, uh, the server has this root, which is accessible by default after you install the software on, on your server, on your server, namely installer-index.php. Uh, the root is meant to take the configuration from the user and store it into a member from an object, namely rcube config. When an email is received by the server, but it has a non-standard non, non, uh, standard format, then uh, we have this method that is executed, namely rcubeexec, which basically executes a comment uh, generated by, by get comment into the context of the server. And we need to think what is missing here. Uh, here is the function that I uh, previously mentioned, namely get command. Uh, it gets the instance of round cube and its configuration and the specific um, aspect of the configuration. It checks if it's empty. If it's empty, then it returns false. Uh, it tries to check for to check for standard comments, namely cover, convert or identify. And if it, it's so, then this comment is returned. Otherwise, uh, it only checks if um, the file exists and it, it is returned. Um, the problem here is that there is no input sanitization in this code path. And we have a CV assigned for this specific issue from 2020. Uh, namely, there are multiple configuration items which can be set by an attacker on the installation route, which is yeah publicly publicly accessible by default um and it can lead to arbitrary code execution namely someone from the internet can pass some comments to the server and these comments are executed into the context of the server that it's that is owned by you um it has an apss of seven which means that there is a high probability that an attacker in the internet will try to exploit this. Uh, and the CVSS is 9.8. Um, we will discuss about this later, but think about a scale from zero to 10. 
uh, which is me uh, meant to uh, signify um, what is the impact of, of that vulnerability. For example, a denial of service will have a less impact, a smaller impact that, than an arbitrary code execution because that arbitrary code execution can lead to a denial of service, but to a full compromise of the service, of the server, namely to steal data, to uh, inject some data in the server, etc. cetera. Um, this vulnerability was exploited in the wild by, uh, by an adv advanced pers persistent thread, um, which is sponsored by Russia, uh, to compromise Ukrainian organization servers. And uh, it is added by CISA, which is an American, American organization in their catalog of vulnerabilities that are known to be exploited in the wild. The other one. And the question now is, was this vulnerability preventable? Uh, and the answer is yes, but no, but not with some uh, standard ways to find vulnerabilities, namely not linters and scanners, because we have some um, specific functions and methods which are called here, for example, get command, rcube exec, and the configuration. And these are not known by default by uh, by a linter or by a generic scanner. But what we can do is to use taint analysis, which is a technique that we will discuss today, uh, in which we will set our cube configuration uh, as a tainted data source, namely uh, some data which is processed by, by the server and that is controlled by an attacker and RCube exec as a sensitive sync, namely something that may have some security impact. So coupling these two information, if a scanner for tent analysis will detect if that the configuration, which is uh, controlled by the attacker, ends up as an input into RCube exec in the sensitive sync, then a warning is generated and the analyst or the developer should check this because there may be some security impact uh, that can be yeah, exploited by some attackers. Um, coming back to the workshop, uh, we will discuss about a lot of open source tools which you can use in order to defend the code bases that you write. Um, the structure, we have some factual information about general software and uh, software security topics and a brief presentation for each topic that we will discuss. On the other hand, we have uh, practical examples. Um, I basically create a vulnerable code base uh, with a lot of vulnerabilities included. Uh, and we will analyze this code base with the tools that, that we will discuss. Um, for each page in the wiki, namely ossfortress.io, uh, you will have here, we will have there some uh, information about the infrastructure, namely uh, the Docker profiles that you need to run or the Docker, Docker containers that you should enter or the credentials that you should use, for example, to log in into web services. Um, you have links to the documentation because the goal of this workshop will not be to give you some comments, but to familiarize your, yourself with the tools and to, with the documentations. And after finishing this, this workshop, to be able to explore the documentations and to uh, apply these principles in your code base. Uh, and yeah, there are also some proposed solutions on the wiki. After you enter a text into a box for, for each tool, uh, then the solution is displayed. Uh, my recommendation here is to ask, uh, to raise your hands if you have any question. I see a lot of colleagues from Ubuntu security team. So if you, if you have questions, they may help as well. Uh, so yeah, be open, ask questions and we will solve, solve them. Yeah, I guess this is a little bit too small, uh, but it's basically a generic uh, generic model for, for software. We have here the development process, namely 
what the developers are doing in order to write some code. Uh, this process has as an output the code base, namely what we store, for example, in our repositories in Launchpad, on GitHub, on GitLab, etc. Uh, beside this, we have the configuration, namely some uh, aspects which are set by the developers in order to model the, the code base. For example, if we store multiple executables in the, in the same code base, we can enable, for example, some configuration flags. And based on these configuration files, the executables will be built. This is the developer configuration that I'm uh, referring to. Um, we also have documentation that is built during the development process and some unit tests, which can be used, for example, in some CI CD pipelines in order to check if the logic is correct. Um, beside this, and the last part are the code dependencies, which are, can be in house or third party. Think about the in house dependencies as something that the developed development team is creating and used in another software. For example, if we, if we in Ubuntu security team, for example, want to deploy an infrastructure, you, we maybe use Juju for deployment. So it's something created in Canonical and we can name this in-house. On the other hand, we have third-party de dependencies. Here think about the Rust or Go ecosystems in which the dependencies are vendored, namely copied in the final packages before them being deployed to, to the uh, consumers. After having the code base, uh, then we have the build process in which uh, we have an artifact, namely a software package, which is then used in a deployment process, but in another environment, namely this, this one, which is controlled not by the developers, as in the first example, but by the end user, namely someone, for example, that wants to deploy uh, a solution on their servers, some self-hosted projects. Um, and we will have some production solution, which will use some user configuration, uh, which is different than this one, namely, uh, for example, some credentials for a database. Uh, this is not meant to be set by the developers, but but by the end users, the ones which are using the the solution or on their servers. Uh, on the other hand, we have third-party dependencies. Uh, think about the uh, PIPI package or a Python package. Once you install it on your on your station or your on your host, you are pulling automatically some other dependencies. So this is not in the context of the, of the developers, but in the context of the user, namely the one who is running the code. Uh, and after the code, the code is running, we have here some um, interactions with other systems, namely uh, the host operating system. We have the file system, we have syscall, sockets, GUI, we have signals, namely any method. Uh, that the program can use in order to take some data in order to, to process. And uh, other services to, uh, to which the program may connect are APIs and databases. After seeing this generic uh, model for uh, software development lifecycle, we can look at the standard process for software security. Um, and here we have initially a thread model, namely having a code base, we need to think what an attacker can do in order to create some security impact. Uh, this is something optional, but it's better to have it set and updated in order to know uh, what you should defend against. After having the code base, there are two approaches here, either to use manual vulnerability uh, discovery uh, techniques, namely someone looking at the code and discovering manual vulnerabilities. And another approach is uh, automatic in which we have some, uh, some tools uh, as the ones we will use today, um, which will create some warnings. These warnings are aggregated. Um, these will be triaged 
in order to extract the most qualitative ones. And this, after that, these are validated. Namely, we need to check if a warning, for example, from a linter is in fact a vulnerability. If we can trigger this and if this bug can have some, some security impact. Um, there is a difference here for techniques which may, may be used in the manual and the automatic uh, process of finding vulnerabilities. Um, namely, should we run the code? And here we have three categories, namely static analysis in which we inspect only the code base. We have dynamic analysis in which we inspect the code dynamically and think about uh, debugging or fuzzing as examples here, we run the code in order to detect the bugs or the crashes and hybrid, namely uh, techniques which are using both dynamic and static approaches. Um, and another uh, categorization here is transparent, partially transparent and opaque, depending on how much information do we know about the uh, inspected code base. If we, for example, know the code, then we have a transparent analysis. You may find this as white box analysis. Uh, after finishing this process, we have some valid information, valid uh, vulnerabilities. And these vulnerabilities are then used by attackers on the bottom part or by defenders. The attackers will try to create some exploits. Um, and they will do this by thinking about how they can attack the software, namely the attack vectors, and how they can mitigate some, uh, how they can bypass some, some mitigations. Uh, for example, how they can bypass some ASLR, which may be enabled for, for that system. Uh, and the weaponization part, okay, I have an exploit that is running, what can I do with it? Can I steal some data? Can I create a denial of service and break the system? Uh, it really depends on the, on the attacker or the APT or whatever it is. On the defender side, we have CVSS approximation, uh, CVE allocation uh, and CVSS. After that, we have patching and some communication with stakeholders. Let's, let's pause for a moment and uh, give some definitions for CVSS, CW, and CV. My colleague yesterday already covered this in a talk, but I, I think it's th these are some important concepts to, to understand. So does anyone want to try a definition for a CV, let's say? Okay. <laughs> Let's take it uh, from source first. Um, we have we have a vulnerability, and as I previously mentioned, we need to find out the impact. Uh, we have a scale from zero to ten. Uh, this is the CVSS. Uh, it's a quite it's a quite opaque discussion here about how useful is, is the CVSS, but yeah, it's something standard in the community and I think it's better to, to use it. Uh, so CVSS is just a metric from zero to 10 to, uh, to express what is the impact of a vulnerability. As I previously mentioned, the CVSS for a denial of service will be less than one for an arbitrary code execution. After that, we have here CW, CWEs. Uh, think about the library uh, and the books in a library. We have some categories and the book can end up in different categories in, in multiple shelves. Uh, this applies also for vulnerabilities. We have, for example, uh, CV they may, that, may, that, that may have uh, multiple uh, CWEs, so a single book in different categories, a single vulnerability in multiple CWEs, and it's basically a, a catalog. Uh, and after that, we have a CVE. After we find that the vulnerability is valid, we need somehow to 
let the community know that there is a vulnerability and there is no better solution for this than assigning a CV, uh, offering some details and yeah, this information will be uh, used for mailing lists. There are multiple web pages in which this, these vulnerabilities are listed. So uh, the community will, will find out about the vulnerability in your software. Do you know this meme? Yeah, it's it's true for the entire uh, open source ecosystem, and it's yeah sad. We have large scale use in profitable companies and critical infrastructures. We have permissive licenses which allow the software to be run on uh, any server in the world. We have a code which is publicly review reviewable by anyone. So if you want to run these techniques that we will discuss on a random open source project, we can do this. But in the same time, we have some structure, structural problems, namely some unpaid maintainers. We have some projects which are unmaintained, so vulnerable. We have lat, lack of ethical security testing. Namely, it's hard to find a good security researcher that can inspect the code base. And we have some low, low hanging fruits for, for attackers. For example, it's really uh, easy for someone to create some code QL rules on, on GitHub to find some vulnerabilities which are exposed in the internet. And after that, to create some automatic automated attack software in order to exploit some random servers on the internet. So, could you say a bit more about uh, the CV process? Like, uh, I discover something, uh, what's the process? So it gets assigned the CV and do all people do that? Is it important or not? <laughs> yeah, uh, not all maintainers prefer to Assign, uh, assign CVs for vulnerabilities in their software because there is this um, understanding about about in which a, a CV is something really bad for your project, but it's not. It's it, it's just a communication uh, mechanism for maintainers and the, their users. And regarding the the process after finding a vulnerability in your software you should contact the CNA, maybe MITRE, maybe Canonical, maybe GitHub, and they will help, help you with requesting information and assigning a CV uh, ID. Uh, another process here that may be really easy for you is to use GitHub. If, you're, if your code base is already hosted on GitHub, they have a security tab and after an advisory there is created, you can talk to the GitHub team in order to assign for your open source project a CV ID. I hope it's it's okay for your question. And it it really depends on on the scenario. You may also look for uh, a yesterday presentation from one of my colleague Mark here in the room. So he detailed yesterday the entire coordinated, uh, the entire CRD process. So you may find out what's our ping pong game when reporting vulnerabilities to upstream and talking with other stakeholders. Uh, I mentioned before that there is a vulnerable code base that we will look to. There is Ubuntu Portrait, which is a vulnerable by default code base. Uh, which uh, contains multiple vulnerabilities. It is meant to be deployed on a server and to allow users to control it through their browsers. <laughs> uh, it needs to have an on-premise on deployment. So if you, in the case, this software will be real and not some like code base, this should be deployed on-premise. Namely, you should deploy this on your server which you want to control. Uh, it's written in Python and C, and it has at least 12 vulnerabilities. I'm saying at least because it has some Python, Python packages, 
And I've seen that in the meantime, from the end of the previous month and until now, there are new vulnerabilities appearing in these dependencies. So yeah, at least 12 vulnerabilities. Uh, talking, talking about its, its uh, infrastructure, we have a web UI, uh, which is talking to an API in Python and Flask. Uh, it's using the uh, Linux PAM in order to authenticate users. And it has a C shared object in order to generate recovery, recovery tokens. And you will see that we will have both vulnerability types in Python, uh, for example, standard uh, command injections. And in C, we will have some memory corruption vulnerabilities. Um, this is the infrastructure for analysis that we will use today. Uh, we, will start, uh, we will start with the Ubuntu portrait code base and the live demo, which is a container in the Docker infrastructure that I, that I offer to you. Um, this one is analyzed into a threat modeling process. Namely, we will try to uh, we will try to model how the software looks like and what an attacker uh, will do with this software. We will have we will use here OWASP Threat Dragon, which is an open source tool provided by OWASP. We will have a threat model, and after that, we will we will use multiple tools uh, in order to find vulnerabilities. We will use AFL++ for fuzzing, P for symbolic execution, A as V scanner for dependency scanning, Gitlix for secret scanning, um, Flowfinder and Bandit for linting, and SEMgrep for code querying. Um, after having these warnings generated, we will validate this in order to uh, have some vulnerabilities. vulnerabilities. I should mention that this is the ideal plan. Uh, I don't think the time will uh, let us cover this all, but yeah, the workshop is open, is open sourced in this morning. Um, so if you want to continue this at home, feel free and you have my contact information. So if you have any question after that, you can chat. Uh, as I mentioned in the Telegram channel, there is an open source uh, repository. Um, there is a docker compose.yaml file, which defines the entire infrastructure. And it, it pulls the images from Docker Hub and uh, GitHub container registry. And it creates and runs the container that you, that you need. So if you, do you have the setup already created? Okay. So let me please. So this is the, the wiki that we will use today. It's already accessible on ossfortress.io. Um, and here on the Ubuntu portrait section on the about page, you will have this command, docker compose dash dash profile portrait app. You will have here a link. It's for localhost on the port 8000 in order for you to interact with the application. And you can use these credentials for, for login. So this is the part in which I will stop. Uh, and if you have any question with the deployment and with the interaction, we will discuss. Uh, and after the short break, I have some pre-recorded demos. So if there is anyone who have trouble with setting up the infrastructure, uh, he or she can she who can see the 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 demo for the application. Does anyone have any problem with the infrastructure? Mm -hmm. 
and I'm seeing some persons without laptops. So if you want to stay here and to uh, get a place near someone with a laptop, feel free. Or there is some factual information after after this demo part. So feel free to stay here. Just a short observation here for the proposed solution. Uh, maybe you want to cover this at home. You have this part. Uh, the solution is not displayed by default, but after you enter the text, I surrender to the code security gods, you will have the configuration, uh, the, the solution shown. So this is how the website is looking like the web interface part. Uh, we have only a landing page with a login form. Here, the user should use the uh, credentials from the operating system. I'm using here the default credentials for the Docker container, namely Ubuntu as a username and Ubuntu as a password. After login, there are two functionalities, namely an explorer and an uploader. I'm using here the uploader, namely I was selecting an archive, which is in the tar uh, format and a name for the destination folder. I uploaded it. And after that, I'm using the exposed command, namely the list over here. Only these comments are allowed by are allowed by by the website, namely PWD, LS, find, cat, and XXD. Um, here I'm using L, yeah, I'm listing the folder and it's slash app. I'm listing that, that I'm listing my home and I'm seeing that there is a folder named archive, namely what I initially said in the previous form. And by listing the content of that folder, I'm seeing an image, namely the image that was stored inside the, the archive that I uploaded. This is one flow in the application. The other is for recovery tokens. So if you don't know your your credentials for the operating system, and yeah, it's a bad idea to do this into a solution, but you can generate a re recovery token. You should introduce the username, a recovery token that you generated, a comment, And uh, that command is executed under the user, spe the specified user. So I'm setting here root, I'm using the root recovery token, the who am I comment, and after that I'm seeing as an output root, namely the user for the command. And the last, um, the last functionality in this application, and let me, Open this. It's a functionality which is provided on the internet, namely from anyone who has access to the web service without any logging for image format converter. Uh, you select an image here, an output format, and there is WebP and PNG. And after clicking the convert button, I'm seeing that a new file is stored and downloaded from, from the website. So yeah, this is the vulnerable application, which contains multiple vulnerabilities that we try to, to discover. Um, do you manage to, to set this on your host? Okay.
Um, I will enter the next presentation section for threat modeling. So feel free to set the solution locally and to interact with the application in the meantime. Um, and threat modeling is basically this, namely having something valuable and thinking about the attackers. Um, and I need my clicker. So what is threat modeling? We need to think about the uh, assets that are valuable for us and what can go wrong. Uh, the advantages here is to create a secure design to prioritize our efforts. So for example, if something is accessible only by a, an admin, uh, then a vulnerability there is harder to access by someone from the internet. So we should prioritize something which is vulnerable and accessible from the internet. Uh, it will increase the stakeholder confidence and there is a legal requirement in some countries, for example, Singapore and USA to have this kind of documents, namely formally stating how the vulnerability looks like and what an attacker can do. Uh, this is how a threat model for a co complex application looks like. Uh, you can see the flows, you can see the, uh, the parts of the application and how, um, what are the trust boundaries and how, what an attacker can do. And for this section, we will use an open source tool that I already mentioned, namely OWASP Threat Dragon. Uh, the usual process is you need to create a thread model in the user interface. You will use a model for this on uh, either Stride or CIA. Uh, CIA stands from confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And Stride for uh, spoofing, uh, tempering, repudiation, information disclosure, uh, denial of service, and elevation of privileges. Uh, asset representation, we, we have in the user interface multiple components and we will drag and drop them. And we will we need to uh, manually identify the threads uh, based on their type, status, core, priority, description, and mitigations. And here, uh, there are two approaches, either to use the infrastructure uh, one of your colleague mentioned to me that there is a mistype, there is a typo here. Namely, this port is 3000, if I remember correctly. Um, but to avoid To avoid redeploying this locally, or yeah, you can change the, the port in the Docker config, namely here on the line 23, uh, there is no 8080, there is 3000, and redeploy the service again. But another altern uh, another approach here is to use threaddragon.com. It's an instance which is hosted by OASP, and you can use the local session for login. And here you can start creating a thread, mo thread model. Namely, you can click this button, create an, a new empty thread model. You need to, to set up some details. Yeah. We can set up here a name namely the name of the application that we analyze, Ubuntu Portrait, uh, an owner, a high level description, if you need this. Uh, when having multiple threat models, this is helpful in order to see what the application is doing and some contributors. And here in the diagram section, you have a, a, a button and after clicking it, you have multiple, multiple thread modeling frameworks. And I mentioned CIA and Stride. 
I will use Stride as mentioned in the tasks here and click save or not save. Yeah. And after clicking the diagram, I'm seeing uh, some elements which I can drag drop and create my model. So what you should do is to enter the wiki uh, on the thread modeling uh, section on the Wasp Thread Dragon and to follow this, these steps. And in the meantime, uh, considering the functionalities that I shown to you, namely uh, uploading a file, uh, executing some comments, um, converting an image and generating a recovery token, can you think about how an attacker can do some damage to the server, how an attack can look like? And it's an open discussion, any idea is welcomed. So um, malware file could be uploaded via the upload functionality? Yeah, it's, yeah, so an attacker can upload some files, but he first need to bypass the login. So you need to firstly log in as a user in the system and after that to store some files. Yeah, yeah. You, you, your colleague mentioned that there may be a bug in the uh, recovery uh, token generation or validation, and an attacker can leverage this. And this is true. There is a intended vulnerability there, a hash length extension uh, attack on SHA-256, and an attacker can leverage this. And we can discover this in our code. Other attacks that may appear? We have for images, for example, WebP. Yeah, there was a CV in LibWebP, uh, which was patched, but it basically is a dependent for Pillow, which is a Python library which this software is using. So yeah, this is also vulner a valid vulnerability. Others? We have here a list of comments which may be executed. Can someone happen wrongly here? We have PWD, we have LS, we have CAT and X6D, but we also have FIND. Do we have some functionality in find which may lead to other things instead of finding files? Which one? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We can execute any command with find. So there is a by bypass here. And also we have a name here. What can happen there? Yeah, we can override files. But what happens if a, a name is a path? Exactly. So what threat modeling is proposing is to think about the how the application is taking the input, how does it interact with other system or with the users, 
and uh, thinking how the attacker can attack this. Not really by finding the vulnerabilities, but thinking what may be possible. For a small interaction with Threadragon, you can use the infrastructure of the application that I have shown to you, um, which is the web UI, the API, the uh, recovery token module, and the Linux authenticator, and take only two components and see what's possible in that context. Namely, the let's say, as we already discussed this, take the recovery module and the uh, API. So due, due to time constraints, I propose to go to the next sections. Um, the main part here is that you already have a proposed thread model in the wiki. Uh, so ThreadDragon has a JSON export functionality and you can import the JSON file that I uh, propose here in the user interface that you already uh, used. So you can see You can see this model in the WASP user interface. Um, so yeah. Come on, buddy. The next section we will discuss is uh, secret detection. Uh, maybe you have seen some news in the past with some API keys being exposed on the code bases and so on. Uh, we already have some tools in order to detect this in our code bases. Um, as I already mentioned, the idea here is to search for a specific pattern which may describe a key. For example, I don't know, a, a, a AWS key may have a specific length. We can search for strings with a specific entropy and with that length, and maybe it's a secret, a token that we need to take out from our code base. Uh, it may have some a, a, a false negative rate that is really high, but it's better to validate some tokens which may be valid instead of publishing them on GitHub and letting the attacker access our infrastructures. Uh, the community rules are available. These are quite generic, but if you have, for example, a specific token, token format in your application, you can create them in order for you to detect in CICD pipelines. And the examples here, the example here will be GitLix. Uh, is it's a detector for hard-coded secrets. And the nice part about GitLix is that it's looking in the entire Git history. So if a developer, for example, was embedding a secret into a specific point in time in the code base, and after that it deleted the, the, the secret, the secret is still available in the Git history. 
uh, you as a developer will not see this. You will not see by default the entire Git history, but this tool can uh, can see the the history, can traverse it, and can detect the secrets, which may be yeah valid. And it has support for baselines and custom support, or custom formats for for secrets. And there is a new section in the wiki. Um, you need to run this, this command, docker compose profile static analysis up. And after that, to docker exec into that container. Um, and you have also a VS Code server instance in which you can review the, the results. You have here a link for the Git, Git leaks documentation. So this, this page and the, the steps that you should follow. I'm now realizing that there are only 10 minutes left <laughs> and we are at the second section. Um, I propose to you to go fast through the presentation and to be aware that these techniques are available. If you want to stay after the one, one hour and a half, I will be here and you can, yeah, uh, play with the infrastructure and I will stay here for help. Another meme, and there is a huge problem with dependencies in in some programming languages, especially in Node. Uh, this section is meant to uh, scan the dependencies that a, pro a project has, namely to in iterate through them and to find their vulnerabilities, uh, and it should be mentioned that it's using a declaration file for the package repository or registry that you are using. For example, if you are using a Python code base, then you should have, for example, a requirements that txt file or a pyproject.taml file, which is listing all dependencies and their, their versions. Uh, you have in the wiki some exercises for OSV scanner is a project from Google, which is using the OSV database. Uh, namely, it integrates uh, multiple advisories and uh, publisher GitHub, PIPI, RustSec, and uh, GSD. And it has support for uh, ignored vulnerabilities, namely if you have a vulnerability which is reported by the scanner, but you don't want to, but you don't manage to validate it in your code base, you can mark it as uh, a false, false positive. I will skip all demos, so only eight minutes here, but I want to finish the presentation. Um, The presentation will be available online, but if you see this meme, <laughs> it's about bugs from XKCD. Uh, and these bugs can be detected with linting, uh, which are some static analysis tools for finding issues before compiling or running the code. Um, these are already integrated in most of IDEs. Uh, so, for example, if you are using VS Code, you maybe have some Bandit or a PyLint enabled by default. Um, they are quite a generic uh, type of scanner. Uh, they are used for formatting. For example, if you have some formatting rules of formatting style in your organization or in your project, uh, some warnings may be 
raised by these linters. We have grammars. Uh, for example, we have wake, which is detecting non-inclusive words, or security. And for security, we have bandit, which is a linter for Python. Um, it's, uh, it uses some abstract syntax tree representation of the code uh, and custom modules for uh, detecting patterns of suspicious code, deny lists for import or function calls, uh, and some awesome report generation functionalities. So if you, for example, want to export them in Sarif, which is a well-known format for um, static analysis tools, you can use it. And uh, on the other hand, it has support for baselines. And for C, I was proposing Bandit, which is a linter for C uh, with lexical scanning. The other button. Do you remember this scene from a movie? Exactly. And that's, this section was about searching, namely code searching. Uh, we should search a specific pattern in the code base. There may be some abstract representation of the code base in the form of abstract syntax tree or uh, CFGs, control flow graphs. We can have multiple query types, namely lexical, regexes, or data structures, which are specific to the abstract representation. And the good part here, a thing that applies, for example, for SEMGREP, we have some sp community queries, which are generic, that, but they detect a lot of vulnerabilities by default. This is how an abstract representation of the code looks like. This is how the static analyzers are seeing and processing. And I mentioned SEMGREP uh, is a partially open source code scanner. And I'm saying partially because the core, it's basically it respects a model which applies for multiple startups nowadays, namely the open core, having the core open sourced and other functionality paid built on top of the core, the open core. Uh, it has supports for multiple programming languages, no prior build requirements. You can write rules in your programming language, so you don't need to learn another fancy language for writing rules. You write Python rules for Python code base, uh, and it has default and third-party rules. This scene, do you remember it? Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's named Id Idiocracy. Um, in a universe in which someone is frozen and restored for after a few hundreds of years, and he's the most most uh, intelligent person in the world, so the scene is from there. And this section was about fuzzing, namely throwing random inputs, uh, like in this scene, mm -hmm. to to a program. Uh, a security issue is basically a crash. And yeah, uh, some details which I will not cover. This is an infrastructure for a fuzzer, and I will recommend to you to use FL++ for any program which may have some memory corruption uh, bugs, for example, C or C++. Um, it has some nice features compared to the initial uh, code base, namely FL which is emulation, a persistent mode, which is meant for optimizing. And uh, does anyone know about OSS Fuzz, uh, a project from GitHub? So they have this fuzzer, which is publicly available for open source projects. If you have some code base written in C or C++, you can request the integration in OSS Fuzz, and they will allocate the compute power for your open source project in order to detect vulnerabilities. Another movie, Maze Runner. And this is a scene in which they mapped the entire maze after running on it. 
And this last section was about symbolic execution, namely investigating all paths in a code base and trying to uh, detect some patterns. Uh, at first, I mentioned uh, date analysis, and date analysis can be modeled with this technique. Um, and as an open source tool here, it was Lee. Uh, you can find uh, some exercises on the wiki. And I'm reaching the final part, if you can stay with me for like other five minutes. Um, beside the techniques that are already presented, there are other ones, namely stress and load testing. Um, think about some race conditions in an application. If you are the one you if you are the single person using the code base, it's really hard to detect them. You're using the application likely, so you will not trigger these race conditions, but there are, there are some open source tools for this specific uh, uh, approach, namely JMatter Matter and K6. And for web applications, there is OWASP Zap, which is doing some tests over web applications. It's, for example, it can fuzz some parameters in the HTTP uh, packets. So you can detect vulnerabilities there and is more niched than a generic fuzzer, let's say. Regarding automation of these tools, um, we have Sarif Multitool, so Sarif, as I already mentioned, is a generic format for the results which are produced by the tools in this workshop. You can use Sarif Multitool for uh, offering mul for performing different operations with your Sarif results, for example, merging, for example, querying. You have generic uh, task runners like Make and Poet the Poet, which is written in Python. For IT workflows, you can have uh, VS Code tasks. If you want to execute something automatically before pushing something, you have pre-commits and you can integrate your scanners to run automatically be before the commit is made and the push is made. So before the remote being affected. Um, you have GitLab runner and AST and GitHub actions in order to run some code in your CI/CD pipelines. ACT is a, a open source project that I discovered some days ago. Uh, the nice part about it is that in, it, enables you, it enables you to run your GitHub workflows locally. So before pushing something remotely, you can run this locally and ensure all results are correct. Um, I had a discussion with one of my friends about the aviation domain. And what I really like about them is the, the, is the concept of standard operating procedures. Namely, before a pilot entered the cabin, they have a standardized list of things to do. Uh, and this apply, applies for the entire aviation industry. So I really like this idea and I've created something like this for um, software security. Uh, and I divided this, this in multiple parts. You will see here two emojis, uh, one check mark for one-time activities. You will do this today and that's on. And the other one are recurrent tasks, something that you no need to do from time to time. Regarding proactive vulnerability discovery, create a thread model, take some time for modeling your application and thinking how an attacker can breach my system. Um, the other one is choosing a suite of security tools to scan your code base. You can find the examples in the wiki. You can easily copy paste them, change the arguments and have your code base scanned and vulner these vulnerabilities discovered. Uh, automate the tools. I already provided a previous slide with some uh, tools there, so you can easily write some definition files and to automate them. If you have a C or C++ project request being integrated in OSS FAS, this 
this integration is well documented, so it should be fine. Um, periodically check for dependencies. As I, as I already mentioned, I started this or I pushed this project um, one week ago and new vulnerabilities appeared in the meantime in my dependencies. And it's really nasty. I want my code base to be secure, not really to have spontaneous vulnerabilities appearing. Um, other thing, constantly, constantly validate the warnings for from your security tooling. Um, basically, these warnings are generating lot of lots of garbage. Uh, some warnings which may be not valid, but you need to allocate some time, uh, create a baseline, and the next run of the same tool will be of better quality. And the last thing, keep your thread model updated. Once you created it, maybe you, you've added some functionality afterward, update the thread model and keep it in mind. Uh, for secure users, create some, uh, have this principle of secure by default in mind. After, if I snap install a package, I want it to be secure by default. I don't want to make other configuration. So ensure that this con default configuration is secure. Uh, have security recommendations for your users. I was seeing this in the Node.js ecosystem. Uh, the Node.js folks have a separate page with security recommendations for Node.js writers. So if you have a proxy for your users to accomplish something, do some uh, do a page in your wiki with these recommendations how they can use your software securely and uh the last one is creating gas bomb maybe yeah there is a too large topic to to explore now but uh, you may have seen some artifacts created for some executables which are stating which software is embedded in that software that you download this is an s bomb a software bill of material, which is declaring these dependencies, which software is embedded in, in the end artifact. And the last thing that my colleague Mark uh, covered yesterday, uh, establishing a security reporting process, namely ensure that someone that reports a vulnerability in your code base has a nice life. And here um, have a standardized documented process for responding to vulnerabilities, create a security policy. It should be only a security.md file in your repository and that's it. Uh, find some backup security responders. I was seeing uh, in some reviews that we're doing in the Ubuntu security teams, some re repositories with only one security, uh, with one, only one maintainer. So it's really hard, for example, if that person have a vacation to respond to messages. So there should be a backup person in case of the, the principal person has some, some issues or is in vacation. Uh, and be as transparent as possible with the reported vulnerabilities. Uh, for us, for Ubuntu as a distro, for example, it's really important to have uh, the, man, uh, the patching commits mentioned in the, in the commits in the, or in the CVs, let's say. Uh, attach, attach security tags for your issues. So is an issue in your GitHub repository has security impact, create a security tag and just apply it. It, it makes the life of distros or downstream really help, really easy. And request CV IDs. And to recap the ideal plan that I had for this workshop, uh, we had an example with Roundcube. Uh, we mentioned OSS, OSS Fortress, the software development model, the software security model. Uh, we had a discussion about the open source software, the techniques, automation, and the final checklist. Uh, I want to end this by mentioning that all materials will be open sourced, including this presentation. So feel free to finish this at home. Uh, if there is any issue with the documentation or the solution or anything, just create a GitHub issue and I will patch it.
So yeah, that's all. Thanks for participating.